Okay, very good morning. I hope everyone had a, a great weekend, Monday 16th of September. Uh, obviously by now you've probably heard of the big news over the weekend and the market reaction last night when um, electronic trade got underway on Globex where we saw WTI and Brent spike. Biggest intraday moves ever. Uh, I think at the initial open when I was watching it, it was about 15 uh, and 20% respectively at the initial opening price. So of course gonna have a look what exactly happened, a roundup of the attack on the Saudi Aramco infrastructure in Saudi Arabia. How has that impacted markets this morning? Uh, and then obviously Monday morning, we've got to discuss not only that, but what's on the agenda for the week ahead. We've already had some interesting Chinese data, which was weak overnight, uh, further kind of accelerating the economic downturn apparent in their economy. Uh, but for the moment, continuing to increase then expectations remaining high that the Chinese authorities will need to step in and counteract that. Uh, and then throughout the week, we've got some obviously interesting events. The headline, of course, other than this developing geopolitical renewed risk on the table, is that of the FOMC interest rate decision. That, of course, is coming on Wednesday night. Um, we'll be covering that, the team and I, on YouTube live for that event. So do join us. Uh, we'll kick that off at 6.30 ahead of the event at 7. And of course, uh, given we're in September, there is updated dot plots. It's the summary of economic projections with the press conference and uh, definitely going to be a, an important event for markets. That's on Wednesday. Uh, we've also got the Bank of England on Thursday, but ultimately not really going to see too much from them. Not a great deal that they can do without any clarity around particularly this unknown quantity which is the deadline as it remains at the moment even though law has been changed on October 31st as we're going to discuss Boris Johnson is still threatening that he will not adhere to that request and he will not ask for an extension he is meeting with Jean-Claude Juncker today uh, so we'll circle back to the calendar uh, at the end and have a bit of a recap before I hand you over to Sam but let's get straight into the charts this morning and cross asset class impact to the situation that's happened in Saudi Arabia. Um, so let me just quickly show you the oil chart and, and some of the others first and then we'll go through all of the headlines. So this is the big spike up. We had WTI crude futures last night. So obviously this was Friday's closing price closed at 54.82. We reopened um, at 61.48. So you know, decent $7 bounce. Uh, high volatility at the open. Obviously, this happened actually on Saturday, so everyone was informed about the news, knew it was going to be a bullish signal. Sam and I were actually talking, though, first thing this morning, and uh, obviously we were we were over, both of us, in, in Tuscany at the weekend, so unfortunately we weren't able to really uh, do too much given the fact we got back quite late last night. But what we thought would be particularly interesting was a lot of people might as well got quite badly hurt you know just blindly getting long at the open uh, almost too late and you can see here i know sam will go over the technicals uh, with a lot more detail but we came up to a real quite clear technical point uh, coming up to the kind of june low of 2018 the high point of resistance we had in may uh, from earlier this year uh, and i'd just be you know the high volume because it would have drawn a lot of attention but also potentially going into a little bit of a liquid situation it was a japanese holiday respect for the aged day overnight so their markets closed which might as well have just exacerbated conditions and made it a little bit more tricky so it's not always quite as one-dimensional uh, as just trying to just jump in and get long because as you can see from the initial high point that we've seen overnight well let's go back to the 60 minute we actually got a intraday high at 63.35 uh, from an opening price of 61.48. So you got a decent kind of two dollar rally before then, you know, quite a decent pullback. And we're, we're pressing now down to a 59 dollar handle, uh, which would be you know, a good three, four and a half dollar reversal from that initial intraday high seen overnight. So certainly, you know, you need to be I guess quite agile overnight if you're looking to take on those those types of situations. Um, impact across asset classes though, because this does heighten obviously geopolitical risk in the Middle East. 
um, in, in the Persian Gulf, given any type of military response or at least threat of coming out of the US in particular and Donald Trump. And so typical flight to quality moves, gold bottom, <coughs> excuse me, gold bottom right capping up slightly, uh, gold top right doing the same, excuse me, that's T-notes bottom right gapping up, gold doing the same. Uh, gold remaining up about $10 at this point. Equities then gapping lower. And FX markets pretty unmoved um, in response to how much the other assets did um, move in the overnight session. However, one thing to be clear of here, given oil already kind of giving back some of that initial move, the equity markets also in kind reversing from the initial pressure seen overnight. Uh, and likewise in the 10-year and, and gold. So it's not like a runaway move. Definitely it was an overnight trade if you were part of it. I think now looking for a, a continuation of that, you can see is already uh, it's kind of run its course almost. And in terms of the DAX, we've already got above the opening high point in the futures. Uh, now potentially a gap fill would take us up to around the pivot if we were to get up there today. So quick look at the headlines. What exactly did happen? Well, Oil jumps most on record after attack cuts Saudi Arabian supply. So it was the biggest ever intraday jump after, as you can see here, it's going to impact about 5.7 million barrels. Now, this is of a country which only produces just under 10 million. So talking about half of the country's supply, and this is, of course, the third largest oil producer in the world after America and Russia. And it does mean that at 5.7 million barrels per day being impacted, that's about 5% of global crude. So when you put it in those terms, <coughs> hence the reason why you get such an aggressive reaction in markets at the recommencement of trade overnight. Um, it happened on Saturday uh, after 10 unmanned aerial vehicles struck the world's biggest crude process pressing, excuse me, processing facility. That one singular facility accounts for 50% of all Saudi supply, in fact. Uh, and also there were attacks on the kingdom's second biggest oil field. Also, just seen headlines a few moments ago, the Houthi military spokesman has said Saudi, Ar Saudi Aramco plants are still a target and is warning both companies and foreigners that Saudi should stop their aggression and blockade on Yemen. And obviously this, of course, is that ongoing proxy war from the Houthi-backed Iranian rebels via Yemen and Syria and so on uh, that's causing this friction uh, to escalate at the moment. Now, a few other points that we can go through. Going to this chart here, how actually bad is this disruption? Well, here's a graphic that might make a little bit more sense in terms of historical precedence. Uh, for oil markets, it's the single worst sudden disruption ever at 5.7 million, surpassing the loss of Kuwaiti and Iraqi petroleum, which would be going back um, all the way. You can see here the Iranian Revolution uh, was back in the late 70s, the Israeli war and the oil embargo in the early 70s, and then going back to the invasion, uh, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in the 90s, uh, in terms of that real specific region as well. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, a, a really surprising event. Obviously, we'd seen threats of uh, and gradual escalation to the point of where a drone was shot down, US military drone, obviously in contested waters, capturing of vessels in the Straits of Hormuz. But I don't think anyone was really quite expecting this quite dramatic event to unfold in such a way like this. Um, importantly, Saudi Arabia, um, according to people familiar with the matter, because importantly, Saudi Arabia have not made official comment as yet. They've said they can restart a significant volume of the halted oil production within days, but needs weeks to restore full output capacity. So I do think that's an important point, obviously, how quickly can they get these facilities back online is going to be quite key. Now, from a U.S. perspective, uh, obviously Donald Trump, <laughs> and obviously interesting from a timing point of view, he was tweeting, I think it was about seven minutes before the futures reopening last night. So definitely looking, he knows oil is going to spike. Higher oil prices is obviously counterintuitive for what his political narrative is, which is he wants to control that price at the pump for the consumer, particularly going into a, an election year in 2020. So he came out and, and first of all talking about you know, pinning responsibility. Well, he said Saudi Arabia oil supply was attacked. 
there is reason to believe that we know the culprit. And importantly, he said, we are locked and loaded depending on verification, but are waiting to hear from the kingdom as to who they believe was the cause of this attack. We are under what terms we would then proceed. Um, that was from the president, but if you check out what Secretary Pompeo said, he said Tehran is behind nearly 100 attacks on Saudi Arabia while President Rouhani and Zarif pretend to engage in diplomacy. Amid all the talks for de-escalation, Iran has now launched an unprecedented attack on the world's energy supply. There is no evidence the attacks came from Yemen. So absolutely, there is no doubt in his mind who this has come from. And if anything, Trump has been a little bit more diplomatic this time, despite using the words locked and loaded. So again, this helps fuel that initial move and reaction. Um, interesting reports though this morning were kind of saying Trump's in a little bit of a lose-lose situation here because if he goes into some sort of military engagement that's going to be very costly, could be quite damaging as well for popularity um, going into this election period to come over the next 18 months or so. Uh, but if he doesn't engage, does that mean Tehran will think that they've got impunity and they can just continue to cause such disruptions? which is going to threat that oil prices can continue to go higher. So that's why I think Donald's been a little bit more delicate here with how to respond, letting someone else within his administration take care of the business of delivering that line so it doesn't come from him, allowing himself more optionality to respond in either way, because I don't think they've quite worked it out as yet, uh, would be my take on that. This is one of the other things that um, the US said, was that Trump has authorised the SPR, the Special Petroleum Reserve oil release after Saudi supply disruption. Now, the SPR has been tapped in the first Gulf War, Hurricane Katrina and the Libyan crisis. And the reserve drawdown may help counter potential oil price spikes. So what Donald said was based on the attack, uh, which may have impacts on oil prices, he's authorized release of the strategic petroleum reserve if needed in a to be determined amount sufficient to keep the markets well supplied. So again, he knows he needs to counteract any particular ongoing continuous spike in prices. <coughs> now, some of you may have heard of the SPR, some of you may have not, but a couple of details here, so uh, a bit of context so you're aware for future purposes. The SPR is the US government's complex of four sites of basically deep underground storage caverns created in salt domes along the Texan and Louisiana Gulf coastline. Now, the caverns have a capacity for 727 million barrels and store emergency supplies of crude oil owned by the US government. Now, at the current level of 695 million barrels, so there is some spare capacity there, the SBR holds the equivalent of 143 days of import protection. Uh, so obviously they can release some of this in the situ situations as we've seen here in the Gulf War or anomalies in the weather which can have large impacts in production in certain regions but then they can kind of re replenish those diminished stocks in those situations. So as far as we're aware that hasn't happened as yet but the US have committed to the fact that they're willing to do that. Uh, possibly not needed because you actually look at the price of oil this morning we we're already backing down we've just had a flirt with $59 uh, as I've been speaking so what was a, a sharp gain in WTI crude in a dollar terms of kind of $10 is now just $4 at this point <coughs> okay so you know that was the, the big headline obviously the reaction in other markets equities uh, airliners down this morning, implications of then unforeseen um, spikes in oil prices. However, oil firms getting the benefit uh, of that in a very short-termist kind of way. Uh, but overall, a lot of the move already being retraced for the time being. Okay, quick look at some of the other things that are happening. Overnight, uh, as I mentioned, Chinese data was weak. Uh, it continues that pattern of really... Um, reflecting the weakness ongoing in their economy and, and the real necessity that they have now for further action from the central bank likely to come in adjustments to policy in, in a variety of different forms as we've already seen with cuts to the triple R uh, within the last two weeks or so. 
Uh, but also from fiscal measures, of course, from the government to look to prop up the economy because industrial output rose 4.4% from a year earlier in August. That is, in fact, the lowest for a single month since 2002. While retail sales came in below expectations, let me just flick over to this chart here. So as you can see, the blue line, retail sales below expectations, and that industrial output figure coming in the worst in about 17 years for a single month print, even though it was still positive. Because again, that number tends to track at an average of around 6%. And finally, fixed asset investment slowed to 5.5%. Uh, first slowdown we've seen in eight months, I believe, in that figure. So again, China struggling uh, certainly continues to warrant further global central bank interventions, as we've discussed in recent weeks. Moving the, moving the geographic needle over to the UK. Um, this is the latest, of course, over the weekend. Johnson talks up a Brexit deal as he heads for Juncker meeting. Uh, again, this is all political management, if you like, of what his intentions are. So uh, he was at the weekend saying that he's working and he, him and his team absolutely flat out to try and get a deal in time for that October 17th, 18th European summit. So that then if you go by the existing legislation passed in Parliament in the last week and a half would mean that if he has not struck a deal then by October 19th he needs to go to Europe to request an extension to January 31st beyond the current deadline that he had self-imposed of October 31st. So he's kind of suggesting then that look he's working flat out so that kind of uh, addresses that notion as we saw with the resignation of Amber Rudd that basically all preparation is being done for no deal and nothing's done for negotiation. So he's looking to try and you know, facilitate the fact that getting the hard Brexiteers on board, of course, that better to get a deal over the line than to delay again. And also, of course, it works with the management of public perception. He, him showing that he's trying to do all that he can to deliver the will of the people on balance. Um, and this comes, of course, with your one of your opposition threats, not being Labour, but Liberal Democrats, who've come out at the weekend and said they've pledged to revoke Article 50 if they win the election. So no more, let's have a second people's vote, which they've been um, pursuing for the last three years. The Liberal Democrats have now upped the ante, and they're saying, we're going to cancel Brexit. Now, what's the strategy behind this? Well, you know, I think the strategy is quite clear. Uh, obviously, the vote to leave was, what, a 4% or so margin, so can you capture and, and make more ground from just having these 18 MPs in Parliament that you have at the moment to something more substantial, not to win, of course, but to be a power in Parliament, as we've seen to cause um, disruptions to the status quo, like we've seen through the inability for Johnson to govern, as we did with Theresa May, but then also obviously teaming up with other political remain parties like the Greens and, and Labour, depending on which way they go um, with Jeremy or not, then this is probably a strong strategy in that respect to capture the absolute opposite side of those who want you know, a full cancellation of the whole deal. So this definitely is an election um, move from the Liberal Democrats for sure. Uh, and as I said before, not a matter of if, but when that general election does occur. So Brexit headlines, you can expect a couple today. Uh, Johnson and Juncker are meeting later. Um, but is there going to be any type of headway made? Absolutely not. I don't think so. Uh, it's whether or not he can get any type of concession over the backstop on the Northern Ireland issue is, is the one to look out for, of course. But I don't think that that's going to be forthcoming, not given what we heard from his trip to Dublin only in the last week or so. Um, going back to the calendar then to wrap things up and then... Sam can go over the technicals. So as far as today is concerned, Chinese data are already out and a disappointment. Yeah, US, New York, Empire, state manufacturing. Now, that is important because you've got Empire today. You've then got um, US industrial manufacturing production on Tuesday. You've then got US Philly Fed manufacturing index on Thursday. So activity, um, economic data in the US has been particularly interesting. It's been one of the main reasons why 
the Federal Reserve are going to cut interest rates. I believe the probability is priced at about 79% or so for 25 basis point cut on Wednesday. <coughs> it's because of the impact that the trade war, uh, the threat then, uh, pessimism growing over a looming recession with the inversion of the yield curve, over the act slowdown in activity data, because as we've seen, consumers have kind of remained relatively robust, at least for the time being. And so we're going to get the latest update throughout the week on that situation. On that U.S. note, uh, the FOMC, obviously key, as I mentioned, not just the decision or the basis that they're going to cut rates, but how many more times do they commit to at this point in time? Um, actually, on that note, let's just quickly get up the FedWatch tool on CME. Um, for those not familiar with that, the FedWatch tool allows you to see uh, the implied probabilities of interest rate moves defined by the short end of the curve in the federal funds rate futures. So a cut of 25 basis points is currently priced at 84.2 percent and it's actually 16 percent of the market priced for a hold uh, in the meeting on Wednesday which is quite interesting given where we were just a few weeks ago which was a lot of people talking about this idea of 50. That definitely has been put to bed more recently. If we go to the end of the year though given the fact that we're at 200 to 225 basis points well actually the market is priced not just for a cut uh, on Wednesday but for another subsequent cut, cut before year end uh, they've on balance the market position for 43.4 percent that will be in a fed funds range of one and a half to one 1.75 percent the other thing from the UK um, aside from the politics you get latest inflation data CPI RPI PPI on Wednesday uh, that then setting us up for the Bank of England interest rate decision uh, the Bank of England will just be uh, a regular one, so no quarterly inflation report, so we'll get the actual announcement on rates and of course everyone expecting unchanged and unanimous 9-0, uh, but we'll get the updated minutes as well from the line-by-line -line discussions that they had, but of course the uncertainty around Brexit kind of uh, just shackling any really near-term decision from them. Okay, that is it from me. I'm going to hand you over to Sam, let him go over the technicals and I will wish you a great week ahead. Thanks very much. Yeah, hi guys, good morning. Uh, we've all had a, uh, a good weekend. May as well start off here with uh, with the oil chart. You see, as I mentioned, getting up to 63.35 there on the, the futures and just resting on $59, uh, the handle for now, which, uh, well, you can see just the importance of, of that whole area, just uh, a little bit below where we're, we're trading. We've already found support initially on that first retest of the, the 31st uh, of July level and then just a touch below there, which is currently the low of the day, was the high that we had back on the 10th, so uh, just six days ago. As a level goes, line in the sand for the day and the week, pretty good uh, area uh, of support to consider. Of course, already down quite heavily and uh, still, uh, well, heavily from that high, so still up just over four bucks uh, from where we uh, finished and closed the day on, uh, on Friday. And just bringing in that daily chart you can just see uh, the that high level going back to, to May last year and of course that trend line which was tropic, choppy uh, but then we did eventually get that uh, sort of close through uh, and I'm on about this one starting in May you can see that we've got that breakthrough uh, we're just from the high from last year to then the April high uh, but also just finding a bit of support on that now as well so as an area goes literally that low of the day is, is pretty uh, important and, and one to definitely consider. Also looking at uh, longer charts, bring in the, the S&P which uh, gapping lower uh, as many risk assets did and we're just starting to, and we'll put this on a 15 minute before we look daily I should say, we're just starting to get a trend from the bottom uh, of the day to here and then we're not far away from that coming in. It's the same of course as you'd expect in the Dow Jones as well, those trend lines here you can see it's being respected uh, a lot more. So just keep an eye on that, especially if the, the DAX was to, to come under pressure and break its similar pattern, which you're about to see here now, just from those lows, a bit more choppy, but again, you wouldn't necessarily disregard that for, for the DAX and the Euro stocks alike, which you can see it just drifting lower than it may well lead to a fall down uh, in US equity. So worth having those trend lines on, uh, if you like, as a, a line in the sand daily chart of the S&P 
Uh, obviously, we weren't too far away from the, the all-time high on the finish on Friday the 13th. Let's just draw that up. You can see we, uh, well, if we had had a similar day to the Thursday, we probably would have made that. Uh, in terms of levels to, to be aware of and, and of interest, around 29.60, uh, certainly, you know, while a fair whack away now, 30 points or so, is a, is a level that the Bulls will, will want to de uh, defend. You can just see the importance of this whole area historically. Uh, and again, uh, be keeping a close watch on that. Below there, obviously, we haven't had a proper test of 29.45, so that's something I would still have marked up. Uh, as well and that all-time high not far uh, away another longer term chart that uh, I want to keep an eye on of course we'll go through this in the, the daily strategy a uh, weekly strategy I should say later on uh, is T notes and I'm just going to put this onto a weekly uh, chart here uh, and just the importance actually of, of where we hit last week um, you can see was the the previous high on the futures that we had in, in September 2017 uh, and really, if we just bring up the currency tool just for the percentage, so last week's move, give or take a, a couple of uh, figures, yeah, 2%. So the biggest down move in, in T note price since November 2016. Does something happen in that month? I, I can't quite remember uh, anyway uh, worth keeping an eye on this level that we're, we're currently trading at here on, on T notes we found some good resistance before breaking through there uh, back in July uh, and we've had a good bounce off that uh, well from the obviously we're having gapped higher but below there there could well be a bit more room for it to to fall down and a couple of decent trend lines as well I'd have on on the week which gives it maybe that last bit of support before a bigger move lower, just a bit below where we're trading on that trend line. So that weekly trend here starting on the, the 25th of March 2019, that week anyway, uh, worth keeping uh, a watch on that. Of course, it did gap higher, as did gold and, and silver. Let's have a quick look at this just uh, on that 60-minute chart. So bringing that in, we briefly got above Friday's high and we're now just knocking around the R1. Uh, for the day for, for gold, which has you know, come up uh, a fair bit from that double top that we had uh, back on the 4th uh, of September and 26th of August. We broke out that mini range. We tried to get above it a couple of times and couldn't. Uh, and for now, the R1 uh, finding uh, quite good support on that. And really, I, I would say, other than the initial low that we had uh, on the spike higher, the key level here, 15.08. I'll uh, set point 0.8 maybe to, to the tick, 07.08. Uh, that would be an area I'd be keeping a, a close watch on. If things were to, to break down there, you might get support other way. So some important lines in the sand certainly coming into play. Uh, it's not a case for me that I do believe equities are suddenly going to start coming lower just off this, this headline. Uh, but uh, we know, as mentioned, there are some important levels uh, in play. And if equities were to recover, I've got to imagine gold here would just be coming under pressure from the, from that low uh, as well. Obviously, big events happening. Obviously, the Fed taking centre stage on, on Wednesday and, and gold price most likely will uh, actually be uh, higher or lower depending on that. Having a look at, uh, well, we'll have to look at the euro dollar. You can see, let's remove the pivots. Ooh. Remove the, the pivots. Having a look at uh, how we're, we're trading going into the week. We'll see a decent recovery over the last... A uh, couple of trading sessions, the we similar to the pound, wasn't it? In that you make a new low, multi-year low, uh, only to then spike all the way higher. And obviously, ECB was uh, the reason for that. Um, and just that high, really, the the level, or should I say, the previous low that we had back on uh, the sort of middle of August, 16th of August, we just can't close above that. So line in the sand. There you go, that's uh, one that I would, would have marked up for that. Again, as we, we come into the Fed, we'll obviously focus a bit more on, on how this chart looks. And you can see if we were to get above this whole zone now, drawing that trend line on, well, 112, 113, and, and the high in between that uh, of the 26th of August could become a formality and we, we get through that. So as an area to defend so far for the bears, they're uh, in control as we, we got that uh, a failed test higher but certainly that is a, a good a level as any to, to keep an eye on 
uh, in uh, to the, the, the beginning of the week and of course the, the Fed later. Bank of England obviously not expecting too much uh, to go on there but a decent push higher, 500 ticks higher than that multi-year uh, low that we had uh, around 120 there which is incredible and uh, this wasn't really interested in, in this previous low around the, the 17th. We also broke through uh, that trend that came in around uh, here and, and obviously Friday really strong push to the upside. Ultimately it will be uh, Brexit that really drives this price. We've seen on, on big days for the US dollar uh, it's not really interested whether that be positive or negative on this, this market. So pound uh, against the dollar really being driven by, by Brexit headlines. So we'll uh, go into some of these levels in a bit more detail uh, as we do the strategy later uh, today. Quick look at uh, what the DAX is doing currently. We just had a bit of a, you know, I never made that trend line, a bit of a push higher. So we'll keep those trend lines on from those lows and any chance to fill that gap again, gold, T-notes uh, and the Bund most likely to, to come under pressure uh, and the US to follow the, the DAX through. Obviously oil as well is on uh, that low of the day, which is such a key level as a line in the sand. So keep an eye on that longer term levels of interest in play for Euro uh, and T-notes uh, as well. And of course the, the S&P. 500. Uh, as usual, any questions, uh, let us know uh, in the chat uh, and we'll uh, get back to you throughout the, the day. Should be a pretty pretty good week, so looking forward to, to covering that with uh, you guys. But I don't speak to you uh, later today. Hope you'll have a good trading day and even better trading week.